Mary, first of all, thank you very much. Thank you all here also to, to be here this afternoon. Uh, and thank you very much on the IIEA for this invitation. Um, I've been here, as you have heard, a couple of years ago, and it's always a pleasure to, uh, and an honor to be back here in, in Ireland, especially at this uh, well-known and respected institute. Uh, as you said, you have um, asked me to say a few words about the um, changing European security agenda. And I think it's a very topical subject, not only of conversation, but also of concern. I think the decision of the U UK to leave the European Union and the first policy declarations of the new US president have not really helped to ease those concerns. On the other hand, challenges are also opportunities, as the HRVP Mogherini has stated uh, earlier. But let's face it, I mean, Europe security is at risk. The world around us is evolving very quickly and quite dramatically. Just note how many changes we have seen in the last five years. This is true in our southern neighborhood, in our eastern neighborhood, also in the north, in the Arctic, for example, but also in Asia and also across the Atlantic. It seems that uncertainty and crisis seem to be the rule. Moreover, terrorist attacks in Paris, Brussels, Nice, Berlin, and also the shooting down of MH17 above eastern Ukraine have suddenly brought foreign conflicts straight into our family living homes. They are not any more very far away crisis in Africa or in the Middle East that certainly move us that are of concern, but they are now conflicts that bring pain, that bring uncertainty, that bring fear, that bring even death in our homes. And I think that makes the hell of a difference. Add to that also the refugee crisis, which further feeds concerns and insecurity. I must say that these concerns and also the conflicts and crises linked to it are at the very heart of the committee, the PSC, that I chair. Uh, we try indeed to foster a consensus among the member states about how to tackle these challenges uh, through our common foreign and security policy in preparation of the decisions of the ministers. And as you know, the European common foreign and security policy only works by consensus. That's sometimes a cumbersome issue, but also it gives a lot of legitimacy, legitimacy if you have an agreement of 28 member states. Now, the, the world has indeed become a much more connected, a much more complex and a much more contested world, say a little bit a more challenging one and even a more dangerous one. And we have to adapt our approach to that. We can do that. How can we get a better grip on that? And how can we adjust ourselves and be better equipped to deal with it? In this regard, I see five cross-cutting structural changes. The first one is what I would call the return of history and of power politics. Indeed, 25 years ago, at the fall of the Berlin Wall, Francis Fukuyama announced the end of history, the final triumph of the liberal democracy and the free market, with the West as the only remaining superpower. But I think developments since then have showed a completely, shown a, a completely different reality. History is back, power politics is back, and in a certain way, history repeats itself. We see it in the East, where Russia invaded another country and annexed Crimea against all international rules and putting the whole post-Second World War security order in jeopardy. But the return of the, of the history is also, can also be seen in the southern neighborhood, where popular revolutions have brought down ancient regimes as they have done in Europe in the 19th century. And we now see instability following these revolutions, and in some cases a return to strong regimes to put order into the chaos. Regional powers are vying for influence and are fighting uh, proxy wars. And we see also a return of history more and more in Asia, in the South and East China Sea, for example, but now also across the Atlantic, where the new president pledges to make America great again. This new reality, reality puts the existing <laughs> multilateral order, the existing international rules-based system, under pressure. It goes also with a return of what I would call emotions, nationalism, say populism, driving forces. A second cross-cutting um, uh, challenge that I see is the growing tension between values and interests. And let me be clear from the beginning. Our values and principles, democracy, human rights, freedom, 
should remain at the very core of our common foreign and security policy, as they are at the core of our societies and of our attractiveness to the world. However, we can no longer take it for granted that these same values and principles guide all other nations in their approach or that they accept them as international standards. The international values-based system is becoming under pressure. It's noticeable in New York, it's noticeable in Geneva and in Vienna. Speaking about human rights with countries uh, like China, Egypt, Turkey, India, <coughs> South, South uh, Africa, whatever, although it is absolutely necessary, becomes sometimes a bit complex. How to deal and engage with countries where human rights are seriously under strain, but countries that we cannot ignore uh, because they are key players in the region or they're important for migration or other issues. This is an issue that has been uh, the element of a serious debate in PSE, and we try to find there a right balance between engaging whilst at the same time using that engagement to discuss more difficult issues such as human rights. The global strategy, which Mary mentioned already, is very clear on this. Uh, she said, it says that interests and values go hand in hand, that we have an interest in promoting our values in the world because they are important for long-term stability and peace, and that peace and security, prosperity and democracy, and the rules-based international order are the, vital in, of, of, are the vital interests underpinning our external action. That brings me to the third cross-cutting challenge, the growing nexus between internal and external security. It's quite clear that the migration crisis, the foreign fighters problem, the terrorist attacks have clearly underlined that close link between external and internal security. What is happening in Syria and in Iraq, in, Af in Africa, has considerable consequences for our daily lives here at home. And the same goes for the Sahel, where drug, human, and arms trafficking go hand in hand with terrorist elements. So internal and external security are closely linked. And it has its consequences also on policy, because external security policy becomes very much internal security politics. We see it every day. Leaders are now much more concerned with the effects of what happens outside the national borders than before, because the public is more concerned. The effects of uh, what happens abroad, migration terrorism, has become important issues in national elections, with a lot of emotions in security and rhetoric. That means that the two dimensions of our response, internal and external, should reinforce each other, should be closely coordinated, to, uh, be put in synergy. And that's also why, for example, the HR Mogherini has organized the Jumbo Council of foreign ministers and together with justice and home affairs ministers on the migration crisis. That's also why we as PSC, dealing with external security, meet regularly with our colleagues from the internal security in the COSI working group. Um, the fourth cross-cutting challenge is the growing diversity of threats in the increasingly interconnected and digitalized world. It is, first of all, Incredible to note the power of well-equipped, well-armed terrorist groups, Daesh, ISIS, Boko Haram, Al-Qaeda, combining terrorist activities with all kinds of trafficking and modern, modern communication uh, and social media equipment to interconnect and thrive internationally, defying not only national states, but requiring an incredible and a persistent effort by the whole international community and the coalition to curtail them. I don't think I have to remind you of the importance of social media in steering up radicalization and steering also international terrorist networks and groupings in committing all kinds of terrible acts across the globe. Nor do I have to remind you how cyber attacks are increasingly focusing our minds and are affecting us, often used as part of a so-called broader hybrid strategy or campaign to target critical information systems, disrupt services, such as energy supplies or financial services, but also undermine public trust in government institutions, exploit social vulnerabilities, or influence popular vote. Hybrid threats, which can be both military and civilian in nature, are not new, but the level of sophistication in a computerized uh, and networked world uh, makes them increasingly powerful. They are a serious challenge 
We also have to straighten, I think, our communication via all kinds of media to counter false information, say propaganda, for example, from Russia, but also propaganda from Daesh and other radical and terrorist groups. I come now to the fifth cross-cutting challenge, and that's an internal one. It's a certain paradox. A paradox indeed, because at the moment when the security threats are increasing, and the world is becoming a more challenging place, at the moment when also it more is demanded from the European Union as a security provider in that world, our means to do so and our willingness to act together in common are under strain. I would say that budgetary constraints often dominate foreign policy options. This is, for example, the case when uh, it comes to planning CSDP missions or mobilizing the necessary means. But besides the budgetary issues, I also witness a growing difficulty among member states to find the necessary political will to act together, to find consensus to move forward, to take the necessary steps commonly and to not only talk the talk, but also walk the walk. There is a tendency to do things your own way or the own way. With the growing insecurity and the lack of means, you might expect a natural need and a wish for more cooperation. That, means, that seems to be the logical way forward. But it seems that in crisis, people tend to fall back to themselves. Think about Brexit. While exactly more cooperation is needed. Ladies and gentlemen, I think the world indeed has become a much more interconnected, much more complex, much more contested world, a much more challenging one. But again, as I said, the question is what can we do about it and how can we get a better grip on it? How can we adapt uh, and be more capable in dealing with it? Uh, and that is exactly what the new uh, European global strategy is uh, trying to do and set out to do. And we are in the process of implementing that strategy. That strategy was proposed last year by the uh, High Representative Mogherini, and it was uh, adopted by the ministers and by the European Council, the head of state and government. It is an effort to put the minds in Europe uh, in the same direction, both on analysis but also on action. It paints the, the, the picture of the world as it is now and draws lines for a way forward to better address challenges in a common way. The title or subtitle of that strategy is then also a shared vision, common action. And that is, I think, exactly what is needed. There have been indeed some questions if it was wise to publish this strategy at the moment of Brexit because it almost co coincided with the, uh, the referendum in the UK. But I think since then, uh, it is clear that the right decision was taken and reactions since then have been further underscoring that. The world indeed today is a completely different place than the one that existed when we had our previous strategy dating back from 2003, slightly adapted in 2008. Now this new strategy sets out our core interests and principles for engaging with the wider world, but it gives also the European Union a collective sense of direction. It puts five strands forward for implementation. First, a real union of security and defense. Secondly, developing resilience and an integrated approach to conflicts. Thirdly, strengthening the internal-external nexus in our policies. Fourth, updating existing or preparing new regional and thematic strategies. And last but not least, stepping up also our efforts on public diplomacy. And we in PSC have been uh, had a, having had a lot of work to prepare the adoption of the strategy, but we are also now very much involved in the implementation of the different strands. It is, starting maybe with security and defense, it is no surprise that uh, in this more contested world, security and defense takes a special place uh, in this uh, new strategy and its implementation. As Mary already indicated, the member states ha have taken steps, have agreed to steps uh, for stepping up their cooperation in security and defense based on a package presented by the High Representative, the Security and Defense Implementation Plan. They also approved a European Defense Action Plan of the European Commission to boost the European defense industrial basis. And of course, these steps go hand in hand with uh, strengthening also the EU-NATO cooperation to implement the joint Warsaw Declaration signed last year. The Security and Defense Implementation Plan defines uh, a comprehensive level of ambition for the European Union in security and defense. It focuses on three priorities. First, 
to enable the European Union to respond more comprehensively, more rapidly, and more decisively to crisis. Secondly, to enhance further the capacities in security and defense of our partners. And three, to strengthen the European Union capacity to protect our citizens working in a coherent and integrated manner uh, on our internal and external security. Concrete actions to enable the EU and its member states to fulfill this level of ambition are now under preparation. They include develop the required capabilities using all tools proposed by the treaty, including also the potential of permanent structured cooperation, deepening defence cooperation, for example, also through the European Defence Agency and setting up a coordinated annual review on defence, but also to improve our structures of planning and conduct uh, of missions and our situational awareness. It also includes uh, improving the civilian capabilities, rapid deployment and training, and strengthening rapid response and reinforcing the EU uh, battlegroups usability. The idea is that uh, the ministers in March at their council, the Foreign Affairs Council, where they will, by the way, meet together with the defence ministers, uh, will this take a couple of decisions on a number of actions and put also others further on the rails. And also the heads of state and government at their European Council uh, will have this issue on their agenda. But let me be clear, security and defence is certainly not the only strength on which we work and have to work. The other strengths are equally uh, very important. Work continues on the resilience, on an integrated approach to conflicts. Uh, and I think there the, the global strategy places a strong effort on enhancing the efforts of the European Union to address conflicts and crisis through an uh, integrated approach by making the use of the variety of instruments that we have acting at the different levels of the uh, conflict cycle. Also, civilian capacities are a key component in all these trends, uh, in resilience, in the integrated approach, but also in the security and defense <coughs> part. Indeed, I think it's clear that lessons from Iraq, from Afghanistan, but also from Libya, uh, all highlight that uh, military action alone cannot deliver a sustainable uh, solution in crisis situations. Civilian capacities are definitely an important part of that and also the need for a better cooperation between civilian and military capabilities. On uh, resilience and building resilience of our partners, but also of ourselves, we expect a joint communication from the Commission, both Commission and High Representative, in the first half of the year in order to develop a common narrative and an approach on resilience, which is an important factor for security, but also a matter of adaptability to social change, to political and economic pressures. Uh, the joint communication will focus on re resilience of both states and societies, but also on <coughs> resilience. The global strategy does not fix a single um, definition of the term resilience, but it, think it indicates <coughs> that resilience is uh, the ability of states and societies to reform, thus withstanding and recovering from internal and external crisis. In that same vein, resilience uh, will also have to be built against uh, hybrid threats, including cyber attacks. Indeed, a rapid and coordinated response against these threats uh, is absolutely as necessary. Uh, there are also a joint communication by the HR and the Commission with 22 actionable proposals offers a very good framework to take work forward and bring actors together. Also, a close cooperation between uh, on the situation uh, rooms of the AIS uh, on the external security with the intelligence unit of the military staff and the uh, strategic analysis and response center on internal security contributes to that goal. And we have seen that recently in PSC that there is an excellent cooperation with uh, resulting in excellent briefing and excellent uh, situational awareness. And that's exactly what is needed, this kind of integrated approach to crisis, uh, that people work together in an integrated approach to threats, uh, bringing together all instruments and policies, uh, those of the member states, internal, external, but also in close complementarity and synergy, working together side by side, hand in hand. Uh, this is, of course, not new, this integrated approach, but um, we already had the, what is called the comprehensive approach. Although I think the term of integrated approach is much better, and it's also because it illustrates more what is needed, that instruments have to be integrated. And it's also a term that is preferred, by the way, by the HR. So this is not new. 
But what is new is that it is uh, becoming more and more important and systematically necessary because the nature of the threats just simply requires more efforts to create uh, such strong uh, synergies. And this is certainly the case when it comes to pressing crises like the migration crisis or terrorism, but also hybrid. The need for such an integrated approach uh, is clear, but that is not to say that things are very much easy to realize, to, happen, to make happen. There are many challenges and it requires indeed persistent efforts and a strong push to arrive at such an integrated approach. One of the challenges is certainly that it has to bring together actors from different worlds. Uh, the one of diplomats, the one of the military, the man of the policeman, the man of development, uh, the judges. They all speak their own language. They all have their own way of working, of thinking, of reacting, of control and command. So it's not easy to let them sing from the same sheet or read from the same page. And I think it would be a mistake to take for granted because it is needed that it will also happen. I think we have to work to that, uh, in that direction uh, in a day-to-day -day effort. As always, the devil is always in the detail, uh, not at a strategic level, also maybe, but especially also when it comes down to the more down-to-earth operational level. Of, of particular importance is certainly, as I said already, the strengthening and the operationalization between uh, internal and external security, that nexus between CFSP and CSDP and FSJ uh, and uh, uh, GHA actors, just as in home affairs. I think the strategy is very clear on that. The external cannot be separated from the internal, and strengthening the internal external policy nexus should run as a red thread through all our actions. I've said this is not easy, this is challenging, but I think a lot of progress has been made, for example, in the field of migration, uh, where indeed, for example, in the agreement with Turkey, the stricter control at the borders, the implementation of the Valletta Agreement, but also of the compacts and the partnership uh, framework agreements that have been signed with five priority countries in Africa have shown that this cooperation can happen and is also happening. We have joint missions where you have the JHA people, the uh, AIS, the Commission people, negotiating these agreements and implementing them, involving the different instruments, uh, not only the uh, police work, but also uh, working on the grassroots, uh, education, jobs, uh, reinforcing capacities of uh, border services, but also on humanitarian issues and returns and readmissions. So there have been quite concrete results and ministers have seen that and have also noted that. Also our operation, for example, military operation, Operation Sophia, is now working very closely with Frontex uh, and the EU, EU Coast and Border Guard Agency, uh, not only to save lives, and that's important, but also to tackle the businessmen of human uh, traffickers and smugglers, and train uh, Libyan Coast Guard and also address arms uh, trafficking in violation of the UN uh, Security Council resolutions. Also in the Sahel, um, a key area when it comes to migration but also to counter-terrorism and human trafficking, uh, where drug trafficking and arms trafficking are all intertwined, uh, there is uh, an action that is in, in common, on common ground. We have some CSDP missions there uh, and we have now started what we call a regionalization process where this uh, two civilian missions and a military mission in Mali and Niger are made to work closer together, uh, promoting the integration also of the cooperation between the different countries in that area called the G5. Uh, so helping to try to develop cross-border cooperation but also regional cooperation. Uh, also efforts carried out in relation to uh, or in coordination with the EU Trust Fund uh, linked to the migration file. In counterterrorism, you have the same, uh, the same approach, uh, trying to bring this nexus between internal and, and external security policy actors, uh, stepping up not only information exchange, but also cooperation in the field. Uh, not in the least, for example, when because we have all this issue of the foreign terrorist fighters coming back. I don't know if this is really a top issue in Ireland, but in, I know in many countries in Europe, it is a, a very difficult issue, and we have to address this in a hol holistic way. And here also the involvement of different actors from the CFSP, CSDP side, from the Justice and Home Affairs side, but also development people joining up in this kind of um, counter-terrorism dialogues that we have developed with uh, a, couple of a couple of countries in the south, Tunisia, uh, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, um, has been very, very fruitful. Also, the uh, CT experts that have been uh, posted in, uh, in uh, delegations, EU delegations, has, uh, have proven to be very useful, not in the least uh, for further situational awareness, but also for the exchange of uh, information. 
And I must say that we in uh, the external action service are actively contributing towards uh, the security discussion in the justice and home affairs field, including through the Security Union Task Force, but also participation of the higher rep herself or a representative in the councils of the justice and home affairs. Also, as I said, uh, sometimes rare joint meetings between the PSC and the COSI, internal and external security happen, and uh, sometimes also joint uh, FAC, uh, Foreign Affairs Council, with uh, the meeting with the ministers of uh, justice and home affairs uh, are taking place. So much is being done to better integrate our approach to strengthen and operationalize that nexus between internal and external security, uh, addressing the, the growing challenges. I think progress is being made, but of course, much more work needs to be done. Uh, I think the reality of today just simply commands it. Now, one last word maybe on public diplomacy. Last, last but not least, I would say. I think we have to adapt also our foreign and security policy communication to uh, better reach the new communication and cyberspace public, as we have also to adapt and straighten our communication via other media to counter false information, let me call it, propaganda. Um, I mentioned that already before. We are building here on the good work of the, uh, what is called the East Stratcom, uh, a team in the External Action Service that is working on messaging towards the Eastern European countries on countering this information in, uh, from Russia um, now we're also working of improving that outreach in the, uh, towards the MENA region and the Western Balkans. This in close cooperation with our delegations, but also with the member states. And we discussed this issue last week in PSC, and the general feeling was that indeed we need to do much more. And I think also a seminar is going to take place with the 28 uh, spokespersons uh, next month to uh, find best way of uh, furthering uh, this action. I think it's also a need uh, for better communicating about what we do both at home and externally. I think there's a clear gap here that has to be addressed. There are several aspects, starting with acknowledging some of our successes to reflect indeed what the European Union has achieved collectively on the basis of uh, significant common political, financial and human investments. And maybe we need to have a bit more faith in ourselves uh, Let's not forget how the European integration has been able to create, after centuries of wars and conflict, an area of unprecedented stability, wealth, prosperity, and well-being of our citizens on our continent. With no equal, a unique example of odd for other regions, with values and principles at its core, and as a power of powerful aspirational force for people and nations all over the world. We are also world champions in world trade and investment, and also the largest humanitarian donor. I think we should be conscious of that, and sometimes also be a little bit remindful of it. I think it's also quite remarkable that when Theresa May recently met with the US president, the new US president, she underlined, despite Brexit, the importance of a strong EU for Britain. It seemed to be an eye-opener for the new US president. The um, High Representative, in her recent contacts with uh, the new Secretary of State uh, Tillerson, and also in other contacts in the United States, emphasized not only the willingness of the European Union to continue to build a strong EU-US partnership on the basis of shared interests and shared values, but also reminded of the critical importance of that partnership for security and prosperity, not only in the European Union, but also in the United States and the wider world. The EU being the indispensable partner of the United States as a security provider, together with the US representing 50% of the global wealth and one-third of world trade, and you being the source of 80% of foreign direct investment flows into the US. 50 mil 15 sorry, million jobs on both sides of the Atlantic depend on transatlantic trade. I don't know if you have seen uh, Javier Solanas, the former uh, EU High Representative for Foreign and Security Policy, but also former Secretary General of NATO and now a distinguished uh, fellow at Brookings Institution, that he mentioned in a recent article that the world needs the European Union now more than ever. Despite recent crisis and the hard blow dealt by the Brexit vote, the EU might well be, according to him, 
the world's best line of defense against today's most serious threats, isolationism, protectionism, nationalism, and extremism in all forms. And he pleads, calls for a European Union first mantra, but not one that would be an exercise of unilateralism, on the contrary, one that would compel member states to look beyond their narrow national interests, defend openness, defend multilateralism, and confront head-on the exclusionary, exclusionary political forces that have lately been gaining ground. I must say that uh, the High Representative, uh, the message that the High Representative gathered in all her bilateral meetings that she has had last weeks uh, from many contacts with foreign ministers and leaders from all many places uh, in the world, that message is that, uh, and that happened in the margins of the G20, of the Bonn meeting, uh, but also the Munich Security Conference, and that message is that the world looks at the European Union as a strong, reliable, cooperative, and indispensable partner a much more stronger one than we usually realize, and an even more indispensable partner in dangerous and confused times, when rules are too often perceived as a constraint for some and not as a guarantee for all. Ladies and gentlemen, I have been too long. Um, I think the world has undoubtedly become a more challenging place, and we have to adapt to it, that's for sure. I think it's not going to be easy. It's uh, going to be even challenging. But as I said, challenges are also opportunities. And if this is going to be a real American first policy, things will look maybe different. And some countries might be looking towards the European more and more. So we have to make sure that we uh, are ready for this new world. As I said, work is ongoing. Uh, but I think much more needs to be done. But that does, does make it more interesting, isn't it? Thank you.